gender issues in Japan. How is Japan doing? Uh, that's what the first few stories for tonight are going to be about. Basically, um, not a, not much of a news flash, of course, but uh, yeah, just uh, the statistics came out once again that uh, from NHK. Uh, an international survey shows that female representation in national parliaments around the world has reached the highest level ever. However, Japan, um, although the average level around the world is 25.5%, which is still astoundingly low, Japan actually has less than 10% of its lower house members are actually women. Um, and this is particularly astounding given that, uh, you know, in Japan, well, I'll explain in a moment, but, you know, Japan, they basically, this isn't a situation like where you have everybody running in races in different places. So you could have lots of women competing for seats, but if none of them win, you know, the seats, uh, if they all just lose by 1% to a man in every seat, you can end up with zero women in a first past the post electoral system. However, Japan is different. Japan has a mixed member proportional representation system, which means that, uh, yeah, you, you can have um, uh, the parties can decide themselves that basically when people vote for a person, sure, that person will win, whoever that is, but they, can, they also vote for a party. And basically the parliament is composed of the number of seats that that party won. So if 30% of people vote for the LDP, the LDP gets to put up a list of people where they can decide it can be whoever they like. They don't have to actually get elected, those people. They're just people who are nominated by the party to fill the 30% of seats that they win. And those could be Martians. You know, they, they could be anything. Um, and so basically parties in Japan have a discretion to decide themselves how many women are in parliament. You know, they, they get to decide that. And actually countries with similar systems, uh, like in Scandinavian countries uh, and also in New Zealand and so on that has a similar system. Yeah, the parties actually decide um, in some countries, like I believe in Scandinavian countries, they actually have legally mandated quotas for gender representation. But in most countries, parties just decide under their own party rules to have to have minimum levels. But in Japan, yeah, it's funny, you have these astound astoundingly low rates, which means that, um, yeah, out of the, um, you know, Japan was the... What was it? Less than 100. What was the number? Out of 193 countries, Japan was uh, lower than 100. What was it? It was like 165th out of 193 in terms of women representation, which is just astounding given that the electoral system was 166th on the list. One place lower than a year earlier uh, out of 193 nations. So it's pretty awful. And... I know that there's, you know, there are some people who like to say, oh, you're just being woke and you're just virtual signaling. And in the end of the day, you know, the best qualified people or whatever should do it. You know, if there aren't women who aren't interested in politics, we shouldn't force them to get into politics. But the thing is, is that, you know, if you don't have, particularly in like governing the country in terms of politics and so on, if you don't have women, you know, representing, you actually, <laughs> wing star, they don't need me in parliament. Uh, but if you don't have proper representation, again, you just ha you have people who can't see or visualize, you know, issues that are relevant to 50% of the population. I mean, gender, I realize, is no longer considered, uh, it never was, I should say, a binary thing, of course. There are lots of permutations, but, but generally, you know, women are generally make, considered to make up half of the population. They face a lot of issues that elderly men, even well-intentioned men you know just just can't you know see or normally wouldn't understand unless they can actually see it through the sort of perspective of a woman and this means that you end up with uh, bad issues and, and policy issues and whatnot which come up with the other these other sorts of issues particularly um yeah there's been a lot of stories this week with the 10th anniversary of the great east japan earthquake coming up this week uh march 11th and um this was kind of known at the time, although I must say, you did, we didn't hear many stories of it. You, you heard a lot of stories about this happening after the Kobe earthquake. But what definitely happened... Hey, Raz, uh, I'm definitely going to come back. Thank you for the super chat. I'll, I'll come back uh, and check out if you've got a question for me later on, but I really appreciate that. Um, with the um, Great East Japan earthquake and with these sorts of things, there was a special on NHK, which kind of casually um, mentioned in Japanese what sounded like cases of sexual assault and rape that were happening within the evacuation centers but they sort of put it delicately when they were explaining how these um each of these town councils which have these boards that consider the eva evacuation plans and the emergency plans for when there are earthquakes or tsunamis and people have to move into gymnasiums or whatever uh, for safety um, they were talking about how all of these um, sort of emergency boards were dominated basically by elderly men by the people by the councillors from the town and so on 
And all of these plans hadn't really taken into account the needs of women evacuees. And this was the case with the Great East Japan earthquake, where in the Tohoku region of Japan, they were talking about how, for example, women, um, there, there were no partitions, so there was no private spaces uh, for women, for example, women who were breastfeeding or uh, women who wanted to change. Uh, there, there, there were um, no separate toilet facilities uh, for, for women or whatever. And uh, yeah, there were situations where, for example, women who were breastfeeding had men ogling them, uh, staring at them and then sort of intimidating them. There were women who there was no lighting in the toilets, which were outside and were single sex. So there were women who were cornered and were afraid to go and use the toilets, uh, particularly at night. And there were women who talked about how um, when they were sleeping under blankets in an open gymnasium with no partitions, um, men would climb in under their blankets and assault them. And uh, as well as stories of, uh, of actual people who, who actually ran some of the evacuation centers taking advantage of those positions to pressure women uh, and, and sometimes outright assault them. And this was pretty widespread. And the thing is, is that the elderly men who plan these things assume that people don't do this sort of thing and don't plan anything for women, you know, to, for extra security or consideration of what women might need for these sorts of things. Uh, and, and, you know, the NHK was saying that they had a woman in a particular area in, in, in northeast Japan who, um, you know, was giving her an account of having these problems and uh, was giving her perspective that, oh, yeah, you need to do this. You need to have separate, you know, you need to have breastfe breastfeeding areas. You have to have areas that can be safe for women and children. Uh, you know, you need to think of security. You need to think of these things. None of these things were in any of the plans. And you have the old mayor of this town who was saying they were so glad to have her uh, on the board because no, no one actually realized that any of these things were problems. And I think this is, I mean, apart from the fact it's horrifying that this was something that was happening. Um, and, and I don't think this is specifically a Japan problem. I think this is something that, you know, could and likely does happen, you know, wherever in the world when these sorts of things happen. But you go back to the first story, when you've only got, even even in the national parliament, 10% uh, of people in parliament are women, um, it means that even if you've got the best intention of representing all of your representatives and being nice and doing the right thing for everybody, you can't do what you don't know. You know, you can't, what you can't see, <laughs> you know, you, you can't address that. So this is why, these, this is exactly why um, you need to have, you know, representation if not 50%, at least sufficient representation to make sure that those voices and to make sure that those um, that those concerns are understood and taken into account when making decisions that can really affect the safety and well-being of women, you know, and this goes into all sorts of areas. I mean, there's no policy that doesn't affect, you know, and it's funny how there are, there are things that uh, when you're in a position of power that you assume aren't gender specific or they affect women and men and women the same, but you don't realize until, you, un, until you're in the position, right? So this is a really big problem for Japan. It's actually really surprising to me particularly given that I mean the, the, the parties with the lowest the the, the left-wing opposition parties generally have higher representation of women but the governing parties uh, which are the LDP the main governing party and their coalition partner the Komito uh, which is uh, um, yeah it's kind of funny to me as well that the LDP has the very lowest but the Komito actually has a very similar low representation which given what they are they they, they are uh, because it's against the constitution for political parties to be affiliated with uh, religions, um, they're, they're, they are definitely not affiliated with any religion, but they are they're es essentially the equivalent of a Christian Democrat. They're affiliated with an evangelical, very, very large Buddhist organization in Japan. It's got like 20 or 30 million members. They've got like one or six, one in five uh, of the population in Japan are a member of this religion. So you'd think from a party like that it'd pretty be pretty easy to get a lot of women representation, but for whatever reason they don't they don't put women on their party lists, and neither does the LDP. And uh, and yeah, when you come in and the stories that about what happened after the Kobe earthquake as well, how when you go into a lawless situation, there are, there are people who take advantage, and there are surprising a number of people who who aren't people who take advantage uh, and commit crimes and violence against women. But the people in charge just don't even realize that that's a problem that they have to plan for. And that definitely was a problem. Um, just to back this up even further, uh, in terms of a survey of the perception of the gap, um, yeah, men and women, I mean, as expected, women uh, think there's more of a problem than men. <laughs> um, and uh, in terms of 75% uh, of female uh, respondents to the survey uh, that was carried out, I think, by Dentsu, by advertising company, 
um, feel that men have a better position in, in the society, while 54% of men gave the same answer, which again is to say, um, men, most men understand that men are in a better position than women, but, uh, but there again, 46% um, of men don't acknowledge that. And I'm pretty sure a pretty high percentage of people in decision-making positions have that. Um, also, you know, the ratio of women holding uh, senior positions in companies, when people were asked how long it will take to reach 30%, the average answer that came back was 24.7 years. Women generally thought it would take longer. Oh, for the, for the prime for there to be a female prime minister, some people thought on average 20, 27.9 years. I actually think in a way the prime minister thing is more likely because it only has to be one person. And, you know, there are people... That, that it could be there are people uh you know there are there are a lot of women cabinet ministers and so on even though they make up such a small percentage i think the idea of 30 percent representation in senior management is a is longer off and uh i know it's not it's not the sort of thing you can snap your fingers and fix it's not just a matter of having the willpower which is only very recent to actually have more women board members and senior managers and so on but you also have to have a pool of people that are in positions to be eligible for that. So when you've pressured women to quit because they've had a child or gotten married or something like that, um, and they're out of the workforce, you know, the idea of reintroducing them uh, as senior managers when, they've, when you're the one who kicked them out of the company. You know, if you want people to come in and be in the position to, to be senior managers and successful, you know, you've got to find ways to accommodate people. Uh, and keep them in the company and keep them on a career track, you know, even when uh, they are going through life changes. I mean, it's just, so, you know, there's really from the bottom up, you've got to overcome the entire system as well as overcoming the expectations that, you know, because so many women expect the system to be like this, they resign themselves to it and they don't have even the, you know, when you, when you, when you don't expect that, um, when, you, when you assume that you're going to be excluded from opportunities for career development or senior management, then a lot of people don't even aspire or even think to aspire to it. This is this is the whole reason that you have affirmative action and so on as well uh, for other forms of discrimination. Um, and this uh, and with many of the same problems that you know you first of all you've got to create the psychology that people want to and can become leaders. Then you've got to give them the support to develop to be successful as leaders. And then you make them leaders. You don't just suddenly do it. So yeah, Japan's got a long long road to go on this. And the reasons for doing it are obvious and they're documented that companies with more diverse boards are, are more successful, they, they're more profitable, they're better for shareholders. And a lot of funds are actually saying that they, they will not fund or invest in companies that don't have diverse boards. Uh, it's considered a sign of competitive weakness to be like that. So, you know, companies are sort of turning the circle, even if it's only out of self-interest. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's uh, a lot of stories this week about that. Um, so that is what's going on with... Uh, a lot of news stories this week, which I think they're actually interconnected. I mean, it's horrible the stories about sexual violence after the Greatest Japan Earthquake and from the Kobe earthquake as well. But I think that the issues are partly linked again just to the to the role and participation of, of women in Japanese society. And it's good to see at least it's being acknowledged now as an issue. But unfortunately, it's hard to see uh, the situation improving rapidly as it should.